a modular QRO ham radio go kit meant for emergency field communications. Hello guys, Oscar Hotel 8, Sierra Tango November, Julian here for Off Grid Ham Radio. Today is the second episode of the After Action Report from the Arctic Circle Off Grid 2023 Expedition. We're going to talk about the radio equipment, some interesting points of the modular approach I used, pros and cons of this equipment and the problems I had deploying it. Stick with me and I'll tell you all about it. You are listening to the emergency broadcast systems. This station broadcasts emergency news and official information on the air for a sign area. Now, as I said a moment ago, we took a modular approach to the communications gear for this trip. Now, I chose the TX500 from Lab 599 because it's the most rugged radio we have available to us in the amateur radio community today. I coupled the TX500 with the PA500 from DIY599, that's Oliver, uh, Delta Lima 4 Kilo Alpha. That's a very popular amplifier, it's a bit hard to get, uh, but it's the best option we have out there at the moment. I coupled that with the Bravo Alpha Tango 500, also from Oliver DL4 Kilo Alpha. Normally, I would have taken the ICOM IC705 with me out in the field. The reason I took the TX500 was its ability to absorb massive amounts of abuse when it's out in the field. Uh, this was important because we didn't know the weather. We didn't know how we were going to be able to set up, where we were going to be able to set up. The radio needed to take some abuse, and it did. For the amplifier, the reason I took an amplifier, now normally, a QRP radio is quite enough for me, 10 watts, uh, even 20 watts if I'm using the G90. It's more than enough for most of the things I want to do. However, because I wanted to reach over the North Pole and get into North America or down into Australia at certain times of the day, working the gray line, it was important to uh, have enough power to make that happen. The higher in latitude we are, the more difficult it is to get that signal out around the world. So the amplifier was a nice backup system that was critical to that event. So we have the TX500, we have the DIY 599 PA500, and we have the BAT500 battery pack also from DIY 599. Now these three things share the same form factor and can be bolted together like other modular devices designed for the TX500. Combining these three devices into a single block or brick, radio brick, was actually brilliant because it gave us a QRO system with the current consumption of a QRP radio, but uh, with a massive amount of power and the size of some dozen ICOM IC705. That was absolutely brilliant. Now, because I was working primarily data modes, I had to couple the TX500 with the DigiRig Mobile for the Lab 599 TX500. That's an audio and cat control interface uh, for frequency changes, push to talk, and uh, to manage the audio levels and uh, between the radio and the computer. Naturally, the primary computer was a Microsoft Surface. You might take a look at my ham radio with a Microsoft Surface video to learn why I chose that one. Now, I also used a Samsung Galaxy S22 Ultra uh, for Winlink and for HF APRS, but perhaps we'll do a separate video on that and the reasons why. Now, although I love this modular approach, it does come at a price. When you are connecting the TX500 with a PA500 amplifier and the BAT500 battery pack, it creates an awful amount of wires. Uh, add the DigiRig to that and you add two additional wires, which, well, to be quite honest, creates a, a wire mess, the very epitome 
of the wire mess we've been talking about on the channel. So in some ways, this modular approach definitely opens up some incredible opportunities for field deployment, but at the same time, the modular approach creates additional problems that we didn't have or we don't have with radios like the ICOM IC705. Ultimately, all of these wires come at a price to field communications. If you happen to break one of them, like I did while we were on the Arctic Circle Expedition 2023, we need to plan accordingly for a broken wire or damaged connector or something like that. So we need to carry spare parts or have the ability to uh, replace one of these GX connectors or have the ability to repair it along with the tools to do so. On the one hand, the GX connector is incredibly robust. On the other hand, it's proprietary or non-standard is probably a better way to say it which means it's probably unlikely the team member sitting next to you is going to have a spare part or the ability to fix your part uh, in a MAM portable field communications scenario. Now, is the GX connector robust? Absolutely it is. But we have to find a balance between something being robust and without creating a situation which makes station deployment more complex. Plugging in all these cables took time. It took even more time when my hands were cold and wet from the rain and sleet we experienced upon our arrival. When the station stopped working, I didn't know that it was a cable that was broken. I simply went through my process of troubleshooting and eliminating potential problems before arriving at the possibility of a broken connection. Now, as robust as these connectors are, this mess of wires and connectors made troubleshooting more complicated. It also made deployment much more complicated than it needed to be. Now, I've said it on the channel for many years already. We need to alleviate the cable mess. This is incredibly simple if you're working CW or voice modes. It's an absolute cluster bugger if you happen to be working data modes. Now this problem exists in the amateur radio community today because manufacturers aren't implementing audio codecs and cat control over USB connections in their radios. This means we have an awful lot of control cables, data cables, audio cables going in and out of our radios, between our radios and our computers, and so on. It's an absolute cluster bugger. For data communications, this setup simply had too many connections. Another issue, and probably the most important, was not being able to travel with this setup with all of the cables attached. So, this means for a data configuration, we need to connect that data line, the cat control line, power, antennas, and connections to the amplifier. This wasn't a big deal for the field station because you set it up once, you stay there a few days, then you tear it all down and bug out. On the flip side, if this were a true emergency scenario, you needed to get that message out as quickly as possible, it's going to take a minute. Now with all that said, performance of the TX500, the PA500, and the BAT500 combination was absolutely magnificent. I have no complaints about performance. Now excluding the cable mess for a second, there is one thing I'd like to see different. That's with the PA500 amplifier. I would like the ability to use the antenna tuner on the amplifier while the amplification is actually disabled. The way around this is to use the bypass on the amplifier to disable the amplifier, but unfortunately, unless you're using a resonant antenna, this also disables the antenna tuner. So if you're using a broadband antenna, which we often do for rapid deployment scenarios or emergency communications, bypassing the amplifier, which also bypasses the tuner, creates an SWR scenario which is unsustainable for our radios. Now I already know someone in the comments is going to say we should always be using a resonant antenna, and I completely agree. However, there are those circumstances where a more rapidly deployed antenna, a broadband antenna, is more important than an efficient antenna, which would take longer to deploy. Ultimately, this problem was pretty easy to work around. And since I have an antenna strategy which utilizes wire antennas, resonant wire antennas like the off-center fed dipole, 
I can put the PA500 or PA500 Echo in bypass mode and still run a maximum of 10 watts on the input when the amplifier is bypassed. Keep in mind, we can only do this when we have a resonant antenna on the frequency we're operating on. There's still the problem with the broadband antennas, but you'll have to decide for yourself which is more important to you. Deployment flexibility with a broadband antenna or energy conservation and the ability to dial down that output power for extended field communications. Either way, definitely some food for thought. Now, another issue I faced in the field was with the DL4 Kilo Alpha BAT500 battery pack. That problem was the charging voltage or the startup voltage to get charging kicked off. The BAT500 utilizes 15.5 volts as a startup voltage to kick off charging. Now, this is absolutely fine as long as we're not using a monocrystalline panel in low light conditions or bad weather. In those type of conditions, the solar panel may struggle to reach that 15.5 volt startup voltage to kick off the charging. My solution for this was to either use a solar panel with excellent low light condition performance or putting two solar panels in series to increase the voltage coming into the BAT500. Naturally, we have to ensure we don't exceed the maximum voltage of the BAT500 and also ensure we only use the series configuration when the weather or light conditions dictate. Now, it might be unfair to call this a problem of the BAT500. Nevertheless, it's important to understand this issue before we get out on deployment. Now, the last thing I want to cover is Winlink performance. Winlink was absolutely magnificent. Uh, Winlink, the TX500, the DigiRig, and the Microsoft Surface were absolutely brilliant in the field. Now, the reason I fell back to Winlink was simply because JS8 Call and VAR AC were not reliable enough without mindlessly calling CQ for ridiculous amounts of time. It would have been different if I had a JS8 Call or VAR AC station on the network constantly throughout the duration of the expedition. But when you don't have a schedule, when you don't know when that person's going to be on air, or when we can't maintain a constant connection to the network, the best we can hope for is asynchronous communications through WinLink, either hybrid or traditional. Either way, I was absolutely stoked with the performance of WinLink with Vara HF, and I have no complaints about it whatsoever. For those operators who are continuously dropping a truckload of crap on WinLink, Please offer some alternatives with the same features and functionalities for off-grid or grid-down communications as WinLink, and I'll present them on the channel. At the beginning of this video, I alluded to the idea of a modular approach to the radio equipment for the Arctic Circle Off-Grid Expedition 2023. That idea didn't actually fail. It was a good idea, but made more complicated by the cost of modularity, which is, well, the wire mess. With that said, and of course, putting price aside, it's actually a brilliant idea. And I'm wondering, why don't we see more modularity in amateur radio today? For example, the TX500 or the IC705. Both of these radios are designed to have additional components attached to them. The IC705 has this bracket underneath to allow for tripods or attaching other equipment which we haven't seen in the community before. The TX500 has a standard standard configuration now which has allowed uh, DL4 Kilo Alpha to make a portable amplifier and battery pack for the TX500, as well as the Lab 599 battery pack, which attaches directly to the back of the radio. This is brilliant, but again, we don't see this type of innovation from other ham radio manufacturers. Why not? Back in the day, there was the Yezu FT897. It had a modular approach. Of course, it used proprietary batteries and things like that, but there was an antenna tuner for it. There was the internal batteries. Uh, you can attach all sorts of different things to that radio, but it was discontinued by Yezu. I think 
Lab 599 is on to something. I also think ICOM is on to something with the IC705. This ability to connect additional components to the back or the bottom uh, of the radios. It's a brilliant approach and I'll continue forward with this. Now that I've deployed the TX500, I mean, I'm really happy with what I learned. I'm a bit disappointed about all of the wires. I wish there was a way to get rid of many of the wires that we're reliant on for data communications. So I think from this point forward, I'm gonna to start to look at the ICOM IC705, how we can make it more modular for field communications and uh, see which one actually ends up being the better radio in the end. Of course, the ICOM IC705 has this giant breakable display in the front of it. So we need to protect that display. The TX500, with the exception of a couple of rotary uh, encoders, I don't think there's much to break on it. It's the same with the TX, uh, sorry, it's the same with the PA500 and the BAT500. Anyway, modularity, whether it's building a go kit or putting together your own dynamic field radio, modularity is definitely the way to go and we need to drive this in the ham radio communities today. All right, guys, that's enough rambling from me. I hope you learned something from this video. I certainly did. There's no BS. There's no diplomacy. I simply showed you guys the problems that I had, the solutions that I came up with, and uh, what I hope to see in the future from these solutions. So if you like what I'm doing, if you like the content that I'm creating, please leave me a comment, a thumbs up, or even a super thanks to let me know. And if it's not too much to ask, please share this video with someone or someplace where other operators might enjoy it. Rock and roll, guys. Thanks for watching. Ciao.